Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, chapter number two. And I hope you got your grace notes for tonight. If you didn't, you can uh, get a copy over to you real quick. You can use that. Just a little, uh, little trivia here. Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book. They were originally one book. And, uh, and then it, it came to be known as Ezra 1 and Ezra 2, kind of like First and Second Chronicles. Jerome was the first one to identify the book of Nehemiah as the book of Nehemiah, and it was in the first English printing of the Geneva Bible in 1650, it came out as Ezra. Interesting, uh, interesting little trivia point there. Um, Nehemiah was a cupbearer uh, to King Artaxerxes, as we saw in chapter one. And uh, last week, when we were looking at that, he got a visit from some of his brethren, and he asked them about Jerusalem, and he told them about the deplorable conditions. And the Bible says that he wept and mourned and fasted and prayed and confessed his sin, the sins of the people that rebelled against God. And then he asked God to grant him favor in the sight of this man. Who's this man? Well, that was Artaxerxes. So tonight we're going to look at the first ten verses of chapter two, where we'll see that God does indeed answer Nehemiah's prayer, and uh, in a remarkable way. Nehemiah two verse one, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king. The wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lie at waste? And the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall I journey thee? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah, and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertained to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and a horseman with me. When sent Balak the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, made the statement that it is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. Artaxerxes, Nehemiah's boss, had the reputation of being a very stern man. So Nehemiah used the only effective tool he had for moving a man who he was powerless to change, and that was the mighty tool of prayer. Perhaps Nehemiah learned to use this tool because of what Solomon wrote in Proverbs 21, verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And as the rivers of water, he moveth it whithersoever he will. You know, isn't it amazing how God can move upon someone's heart like that? And especially here, in this case, the king. It was hard to get into the court, the Persian court. It was even harder to get out. And so Nehemiah knew that if he said anything, uh, 
and it could be disastrous. But the distressing news of Jerusalem's broken down walls raised in him an urgent desire, and that was to rebuild the city's protection. Because we know from also a verse in Proverbs that um, he that hath no rule of his own spirit, the Bible says, is like a city that is broken down without walls. <coughs> well, a city without walls is open to enemy attack. And so the same thing is true of a person who has no control of their own spirit. And so realizing the importance of that, um, Ezra was, I mean, Nehemiah was so burdened uh, over what was going on there in Jerusalem. But he knew the king was unlikely to give him leave because we won't look at it, but if you'll just write the reference down, Ezra chapter 4, verses 17 through 22, King Artaxerxes had already made a decree that Jerusalem should not be rebuilt because Jerusalem had the reputation of being a troublous city, a city of rebellion and so forth, where they rebelled. So uh, he had already made a decree in Ezra 4 that had forbidden it. So Nehemiah, he's kind of between a rock and a hard place. You understand what I'm saying? He's got this burden on his heart, but he's facing inevitable odds that he's not going to get this done. So he did the only thing he could do. He started praying and he kept on praying. So I want you to notice three things here in this passage tonight. And we'll break it down. First of all, number one, the burden that Nehemiah carried. The burden that Nehemiah carried. We see that in the first four verses. And there I think, are two important takeaways that we can take away from these first four verses. The first one is this. When you are burdened, keep praying. When you are burdened, keep praying. I want you to notice here again in chapter 2, verse 1, it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of our Xerxes, the king. Go back to chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hathariah, came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year. I was in Shushan, the palace. You say, well, what's the deal? Well, Shizlu is December. Nisan is April. So between chapter 1 and chapter 2, four months went by. Four months of praying and waiting. So the lesson from Nehemiah to us is simply this. When God puts a burden on your heart, keep praying. Don't give up praying. Jesus taught us that same principle in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, I would venture to say that if we were just dead, honest, judgment day honest with ourselves, I would say it for myself. Probably my prayer life could use the most improvement of anything. I, I read about these men who spend hours a day in prayer, and I'm like, I'm not there. It's not that I don't pray, but I don't pray hours a day. And I don't know how many times I prayed for something, and, and, and after, after a while I just kind of stopped praying. But Jesus said, men are always to pray, not to faint, not to quit. Ephesians 6.18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching with all perseverance. That means to keep it up. And supplication for all sins. Paul said in Colossians 4 and verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So when you're burdened, keep praying. Now I know that there's some of you right now who God has placed a burden on your heart about something. What's the burden? Well, perhaps there are walls that are broken down. We certainly know that in America, the walls of morality and decency are broken down. There are walls in marriages that are broken down. There's walls in relationships that are broken down. There are people whose very lives are described as having been broken down. So has God put a burden on the person? If he has, then keep praying. And if he hasn't, then pray that God will give you a burden. And keep praying until he does. And then pray after you get burdened. But there's a principle here. And that is that when you are burdened, when, when God's put a burden on your heart, don't stop praying. Keep praying. Here's the second takeaway, that while you are praying, keep working. While you're working, keep, while you're praying, keep working. Notice in Nehemiah 2.1, what, what, what it says. 
came to pass in the month of Nisan, so four months later, in the 20th year of our existence, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave him what he did. He went back to work. Nehemiah went back to work. He waited for God to open the door. Now, what took place in those four months between chapters 1 and 2 isn't told to us. But honestly, folks, I think we can read between the lines. There's no doubt in my mind that Nehemiah was so deeply troubled over the devastation of Jerusalem that he was praying fervently, daily, with a broken heart. And finally that day came when he stood before the king and the burden that he felt could no longer be hidden on his face. And at that very moment when he faced this crushing burden that was almost intolerable, God came through and answered his prayer. He didn't have to speak to the king at all. The king spoke to him. The initiative was not in Nehemiah's hands. It was in God's hands. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 2. The, 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 verse 1, part of the end of that verse. Now I have not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. You see, it was a time punishable by them to be sat in the king's presence. If you were his cupbearer, listen, that, in that day, the only way that a monarch was deposed was by assassination. And typically, it was by poisoning their food or their drink. So if there was the emotional state of his cupbearer, he, he, he bet, I mean, what do I do? he bet his life. I mean, literally, that king bet his life on the integrity of his cupbearer. And if there was some emotional distress in his cup there, that didn't bode well for the king. Maybe he was a part of an assassination plot or something. And, and so Nehemiah had every right to be afraid. He was concerned. Verse 3. And he said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? I want you to understand how wise and tactful Nehemiah was in his response here to the king. Because he did not mention Jerusalem by name. As I said, Jerusalem had a reputation of being a troublous city, a city of her, where there were a lot of rebels and so forth. Um, and so he didn't mention it by name. Instead, he referred to Jerusalem as the place of my father's sepulchers. You say, well, Pastor, why is that so important? Because to the ancient Middle Easterns, a sepulcher was one of the most important things uh, for, for them. They, in fact, even today, um, the evidence of the obsession of these Persian kings that they had for burial sites can be seen in Iran today, Iran, near the ancient Persian capital of Persepolis, there in those uh, cut out are those, are those the tombs that are um, of the kings. And so, rather than say Jerusalem, he said the place of my father's sepulchers. And thus, when he talked about the place where his ancestors were buried, he tapped into the sympathies of the king. Because to them, burial places were extremely important. I like verse 4. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. He shot up a quick prayer. I've heard people call that an arrow prayer, like you shoot an arrow in the human. Uh, you know, today we would say that he instant messaged God. Or he texted God. You know, he sent this prayer. I prayed to the God of heaven. The point that I'm trying to make is that God wants us to do what we should do. He wants us to pray and he wants us to go to work all while trusting him to do what only he can do. Amen. So whether God works in weeks or in months or even in years, that's not the point. The point is we should do what we do day in and day out, trusting God and waiting for Him to work. And I'll tell you, when you ask my wife, I'm not the most patient. I mean, you probably think your pastor's the most patient man in the world. I'm not. I hate waiting. I don't like waiting. I, I, when I'm in the store, I scout out which line is going to be the shortest. And inevitably, I pick a line and someone has to have a price check. Like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I don't like waiting. 
Um, I wait about five seconds when the light turns green and then if people go, I don't pop my home because that's a good way to get shot. <laughs> but I'm like, come on, the light's green. Does it stay green forever? I just, I'm not a, I don't like waiting. I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting. But the Bible tells us we need to wait on the Lord. Sometimes we just need to wait on the Lord, and that's what Nehemiah did. He waited. He didn't bust the door down. He waited for God to open that door. You know, God opens doors that no one can shut, and he shuts doors that no man can open, right? And so we need to wait on him. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. <coughs> Psalm 62, 1. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation, or in other words, my deliverance. Psalm 62, 5. My soul wait out only upon God, for my expectation is from him. And then in Psalm 130, verses 5 and 6, the psalmist said, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. You know, we should not be discouraged if God doesn't work immediately. We should just do what we normally do, and then not be surprised when God opens the door. You know, when you're burdened, keep praying, and while you're praying, keep working. Uh, that's, I think that's what God would have us to do. Wait on Him. And in His time, His time doesn't always match our time. In His time, God will work. Uh, I love the verse in Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So I want you to see that, first of all, there was a burden that Nehemiah carried. And that burden, reading between the lines, obviously he continued to pray, he continued to carry that burden, but he also continued to work. And what if he had not gone back to work? This opportunity never would have come up. So it's important that we do that. Then I want you to notice number two, the blessing that Nehemiah coveted. The blessing that Nehemiah coveted in verses five through eight. And I want you to see three things here in his request. Uh, first of all, he asked for the king's permission. <laughs> he asked for the king's permission. Look at verse 5. And I said to the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall I journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send him, and I sent him seven times. So notice there twice it talks about being sent. He might wanted to know that he had been sent by the king. He wanted the king's permission. And you know, the dominating factor in our service to God really is his sovereignty, the fact that he has called us to serve him. You know, God has the right to send his people anywhere, doesn't he? Amen. He has the right to direct our steps, in the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And someone had one time in the stops of a good man are ordered by the Lord as well. He has the right to direct our steps and our stops. Amen? Yeah. And the thing that we need to remember here is that he does send us. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples in John 20, verse 21, As the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And to be effectively used in any service for God, we need the reassurance of His permission that He has sent us, um, that we have His permission, that we have His authorization, that we have His blessing. Um, and in 2 Timothy 1.7, the Bible says that He has saved us and called us for the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So the desire of all of our hearts should be, first of all, to ask for the king's permission, if it pleased the king, that you would send me, and it pleased him to send him. So that's important. And then number two, we need to ask for the king's protection. In verse seven, moreover, I said to the king, if it please the king, here's a second request, let letters be given to me, given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. So Nehemiah only, did not only want to be sure that he was sent, he wanted to be sure that he was safe. I want your protection. 
I want you to have official letters. Uh, I want some kind of protection here. And that's a wonderful prayer for us to pray, that God would put a hedge of protection about us, about our families, about our church. Why do we need to pray that? Well, because when we get burdened about doing something for God and He responds by opening the door, let me tell you something, the enemy is going to do everything he can to stop us. Right. Satan rarely messes with backslidden, cold, and different, mediocre, complacent Christians. They're really no threat to his kingdom. But you get serious about following God, and I promise you, the devil and his crowd are going to come after you like you've got a target on you. Amen. But here's the good news. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the Lord. Um, in Psalm 91, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Well, those are good words for today, aren't they? A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Now, there's a break in the psalm here. And if you'll notice the last three verses, God is the one who is speaking, not the psalmist. God says, because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? Amen. Beautiful psalm of God's protection. Aren't you thankful for God's protection? I, I tell you. Second Thessalonians 3, 3 says, But God is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from the evil. We were in Panama a few years ago, and you know, privileged to go down there and visit the Sherwoods. And uh, so we got to talk, not directly, because I, I don't speak enough Spanish to frame one sentence, but we got to talk through Stan to uh, some uh, police that were there, motorcycle police. And um, so they ride around, two on a bike, and the guy in the back's got a fully automatic weapon and stuff, so they, uh, we felt really safe. but. Anyway, they had a patch on their uniform, and it's J-O-S-U-E-1-9. Josu is Spanish for Joshua. Joshua 1-9, and these police actually on the back of their helmets, they have it, and on their patches on their uniform, Joshua 1-9. You couldn't get away with that here in America because they would cry, you know, violation of the separation of church and state. But Joshua 1-9 says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Amen. Amen. So Nehemiah knew he was going to face opposition. So he asked for the king's permission. He wanted to be sent. And he asked for the king's protection. He wanted to be safe. But then notice he also asked for the king's provision in verse 8. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertaineth to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Not only did Nehemiah want to be sent and not only did he want to be safe, he wanted to be supplied. And so he asked the king for some supplies. Now, do you think Nehemiah was asking for too much here? Certainly not. I mean, the king was well able to give him everything he asked for and more. Well, what about our God? You know, sometimes we come to God and we treat him as though he's a pauper. Sometimes I'm ashamed of how little I ask God for. 
when he is the great and mighty king and he can do anything. In fact, Ephesians 3.20 says, unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. There's a great verse in Psalm 81 that is a, a great challenge. In Psalm 81.10 it says, I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. And this actually, from what I understand, goes back to an ancient practice of kings when they wanted to honor a subject. It would have that subject come before them and, and kneel, and they would say, open your mouth wide, and they would put into their mouth some food, of the king's food, sweet meats, or sometimes even money or jewels. And God is saying here, look, I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Okay. Little asking. I remember reading a devotion in Our Daily Bread some years ago, and back then they always would put a little poem at the bottom of every devotion, and it was on this verse, and the, the little poem said this, We are coming to a king, great petitions let us bring, for his love and power are such that we never can ask too much. Amen? Amen. He asked for the king's supply. He said, how about give me some lumber? How about give me this? Give me this. I'm going to need this for the building. And, and the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? But again, I remind you of what James 4, 2 says, you have not because you ask not. I'm glad that God promised to supply all of our needs. Now, he didn't say he would supply all of our wants, but Philippians 4, 19 says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So what do you need tonight? Have you boldly asked God? Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I think God is honored by big asking. And sometimes we're just afraid to ask too much. Well, James says, you have not because you ask not, and then you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Sometimes we pray and don't get what we pray for because we're praying with a selfish motive. But if we're praying for the glory of God, I believe God, God is in that. God is not in it if I want the glory, but God is in it if he gets the glory. Amen? So he wanted to be sent. He wanted to be safe. He wanted to be supplied. He, play, he prayed and asked for the king's permission, the king's protection, and the king's provision. Well, not only do I want you to consider the burden that Nehemiah carried and the blessing that he coveted, but I want you to think thirdly about the battle that Nehemiah caused. The battle that Nehemiah caused, verse 9. Then I came to the governors beyond the river, gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite heard of it. It grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. We'll meet Sanballat and Tobiah again in another chapter. But they knew perfectly well what Nehemiah was after. And you know, I believe the devil, whenever we say, let's rise up and build, the devil says, let's rise up and oppose. I want you to notice two things. I, I think, first of all, the enemy hates people of vision. The enemy hates people of vision. Well, there were plenty of other Jews in Jerusalem, and they'd been there a long time. But they had no burden for the broken down walls and for the ruined testimony. They were no menace to the devil, but here comes a man with a vision. And you know, in Proverbs 20, 19, 29, 18, the Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. So we need to have a vision. Do you have a vision of what God wants to do and what he can do in your life, in your family, in your church? You know, mark this down. When Satan sees your earnestness, when he sees your determination, watch out. 
Does your service for God cause Satan any concern at all? I want to be like that guy who, when he gets up in the morning, Satan says, oh, no, he's up. I mean, how much overtime has the devil to do in hell because of our church? I hope he has working overtime. The truth of it is, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. For some people, opposition raises doubts about whether they're in God's will. But in Nehemiah's case, the opposition of those who despise the things of God served as an affirmation that he was indeed doing God's will. And our job, our mission is simply to be faithful. Amen? It is. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's what God requires of us, faithfulness. The enemy hates people of vision. But then notice, secondly, the enemy hinders people of vocation. I'm talking about Christian workers. You know, when you attempt to do a work for God, the devil is going to do his best to hinder you, to stop you. I like what someone said, the door of opportunity always swings on the hinges of opposition. Anything worthwhile that was ever worth doing didn't happen easily. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. We have an adversary. We have an enemy. And he is actively engaged in all those who want to put on the, the Christian armor and go to war. And we are in a warfare. Paul said to young Timothy, thou therefore endure hardness, chapter 2 of, of First Timothy. Thou therefore, uh, pardon me, 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I'm glad I'm a soldier in God's army. Amen. Amen. He is the captain of our salvation. It was the late Dr. Bob Jones Sr. who once said, the test of a man's character is what it takes to stop you. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to be hindered by Satan. In 1 Thessalonians 2.18, he said, Wherefore, we would have come again, often, once and again, Paul said, but Satan hindered us. He would have come to visit that church in Thessalonica, but Satan hindered him. Anytime we say, together we can do it, the devil and his crowd are going to respond by saying, together we can stop it, right? But the opposition did not stop Nehemiah, and it should not stop us either. As we attempt to do work for God, uh, two things we need to remember. First of all, remember this. It's not our work, it's his work. Amen. Amen. This is not my church, it's God's church. Amen. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is God's work. Also in Ephesians 6, 10, the Bible says, We don't stand in our power. We stand in his power. Amen. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So this is God's work. God is responsible for it. It's also important for us to remember that we do not stand in our own power, but we stand in his power. Amen. So Nehemiah agonized. We see that in, verses, uh, in, in the first chapter. He agonized and in going into chapter 2. And then when he gets there to Jerusalem, we're going to see that he organized. He organized the work crews, and then we're going to see that he finalized by the grace of God. So I entitled this message, Waiting on God to Work, because Nehemiah relied upon God to arrange the circumstances of his life. He was committed to carrying out the plan of God, but he waited on God to work out the details. 
And we need to have the same view of God's work in our lives that Nehemiah demonstrated. You know, God is constantly at work in our lives, is he not? And often it's in ways that we cannot see. <clears throat> so let us learn this from Nehemiah. Think big and ask big. And don't be surprised <clears throat> when God gives you more than you ask for. <clears throat> and I love verse 8. And the king granted unto me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The good hand of my God upon me. So remember this, that prayer and waiting go hand in hand. And if God has burdened you, keep praying. And while you're praying, keep working. Ask for the king's permission. Ask for the king's protection. Ask for the king's provision. And then realize that Satan's not going to be happy with you. Uh, he hates people of vision, and he hinders people of vocation. When you, when, you get, when you get your work clothes on and you go to work in the harvest, uh, that's going to make Satan extremely mad. But again, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So some important lessons tonight from Nehemiah chapter 2. Next Sunday night, we won't be in Nehemiah because we have a guest missionary with us. Andrew Garcia, missionary to Honduras. So we'll pick up in chapter two, two weeks from tonight, and we'll see that when he got to Jerusalem, what he did, he did some very wise things when he first got there. Um, but read ahead if you want to, finish chapter two, and we'll look at the balance of chapter two in two weeks, all right? Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage tonight. God, we are ashamed, I'm ashamed that oftentimes I come to you and treat you as a pauper when you are in fact the king of the universe. And you said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And yet God, how often we're afraid to think big and ask big or we ask and then we don't persist. And so God, so much hinges upon our burden in our prayer life as we look at this passage tonight, help us to implement these principles that Nehemiah demonstrated. If there are those tonight who want to come to this altar of prayer, I pray that they would feel the liberty to do that. If there are those tonight who need to come to know Christ, I pray that they would come and allow someone to show them how to trust the Lord Jesus as their Savior tonight. Lord, I'm sure I'm speaking mainly to believers in the house tonight, and I pray that you would help us to emulate this man who wasn't even a priest or a prophet or a preacher. He was simply a civil servant. He was a cupbearer. But you put upon his heart an incredible burden. And he was willing to be your servant. God, help us to be your servants. Help us to deny ourselves, to take up that cross and follow you. Well, thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing an invitation hymn, these altars are open. God's spoken to your heart tonight. You'd like to come. You come as we sing. Anyone, I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the same sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. He hath the words of life. I will hasten to him. Hasten so glad.
standing. And I thought about that song. I know it's not typically what you consider a traditional invitation song, but there's several key components to what pastor's message was about that were found in that song. Notice it says the first verse, I'm resolved no longer to linger, charmed in the world's delight. Where was Nehemiah when he heard of the news? Enjoying the lavish life. I'm going to be resolved to leave the comforts, to have to deal with difficulties and oppositions because God's calling me to do something for him. I am resolved. I'm going to do it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. And God, we recognize that there will be opposition to your work. I pray that we'll be resolved to be faithful and to complete it. God, you've, you'll be faithful to complete your work in us. We want to be com- faithful to complete your work here on earth. God, as is in heaven, we want your will to be done here. God, we pray for this week as we go out and about, as so we have conversations and we meet people, and uh, the, the lifestyle and the words of our mouth, God, would be a representation of the hope we have in Jesus. We love you. We're thankful for the word tonight that was shared with us. We pray we take it with us and grow in it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor will be out at the Welcome Center. If you're a guest, stop out and see him. He would love to greet you tonight.